Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another session of CMS University. My name is John Hughes, and I'm honored to be the music director of Chicago Master Singers. I want to personally welcome each of you, whether you're a member of CMS and tuning in from nearby, or maybe you're discovering us from farther away through the power of the internet, or maybe you're watching us after the fact on the recording. I want to welcome you and uh, want you to be part of this community. Part of the fun of this platform of a YouTube live stream is that it really is a community. And one of the main ways that we accomplish that is through the chat. And you'll see on the right hand side of your screen that the chat is already going. People are saying hello and checking in on each other, maybe even saying where they're watching from. And that's really makes it more fun than just watching me. I know a lot of us spend a lot of time on Zoom these days, and that can be feeling kind of passive, but this is a way to become actively involved. And so you don't need to feel like you have to be a member of CMS to post. Um, anyone can, so please do. The one trick to be aware of is that you need to log into YouTube first um, before you can post. So um, take a minute, do that, but then it's kind of like being able to pass notes to your friends in class, or you can even uh, ask me a question and I can put it up on the screen and I'll try my best uh, to answer it. The one thing, if you do want to grab my attention since there's kind of a lot going on here for me, please start your comment or question with four question marks in a row and then that'll quickly catch my eye. I won't be able to um, answer it immediately, but I'll stop throughout the evening and check at it and I'll, I'll answer them as I'm able to. So enjoy the chat and let's get into the material for tonight. Now this is the second of a three-part series in uh, on covering musicianship, how to become a better uh, musician, especially in regards to reading. So tonight we're talking about rhythm. Last week was melody. If you missed that, you can go back and watch the recording. Tonight is rhythm and then next week we'll end with a session on harmony. Okay, so rhythm. It can be maybe a little intimidating sometimes. I think a lot of singers um, don't like rhythm, don't like counting. Um, but tonight, my goal is really to provide you with some real world tips, right? This is not meant to replace a music theory class or anything like that. It's really meant, here's some, just some tips and tricks you can add to your tool belt and so when we get back to making music together as an ensemble, or whether maybe you're even continuing your music making at home these days, maybe these are some things you can think about um, to look at rhythm differently. And um, I'm gonna throw in some practice tips too. So that's uh, the deal for tonight. And I wanted to start with a very uh, simple question, which is how much is this note worth? We have a, a quarter note here. Okay. Now, I think a lot of us would say, no, it's probably, it's worth one beat. But in reality, that's not the best answer. A better answer would be a quarter note is worth two eighth notes, or a quarter note is worth half of a half note. Because when you see this note, you really don't know what it's worth without a time signature. It's the same thing if I asked you, what pitch is this right here? Without a clef and a staff, you wouldn't know if that's an F or a B. There's no, you don't have enough information. And it's a, so this is kind of a trip, trick question. It's the same thing. You don't know what value this has without a time signature. So this gets to this concept that we talked a little bit about last week with proportionality, right? All these rhythms are um, proportionate. And so, Last week we talked about it with regards to melody, that if you play a melody in one key and then you, you keep the same proportion of space between the notes, you can transfer it to any key, right? This is a little different here tonight. We're talking about proportionality much more mathematically. So here we have what I would have called a note tree when I was teaching high school. And at the top, you have a whole note, and really above that, there's something called a brev, which is kind of like a double whole note. But so we have this whole note, and that divides into two half notes, and then 
those each divide into quarter, two quarter notes and then eighth notes and 16th notes and then it, it, it goes on forever, right? So 16th notes, 32nd notes, 64th notes, 128th notes, 256th note, it just keeps going and they all uh, compound, right? So you can say, okay, that quarter note is equal to half of a half note or a quarter of a whole note or a quarter note is equal to two eighth notes, right? So you can just kind of go up and down this note tree to uh, find values. It's not until we have a time signature though that they actually have a numerical value in terms of a beat. So let's look at this time signature. This is three, four, right? The top number tells you how many beats there are in a measure. So in this case, there are three beats per measure. And the bottom note tells you which of these notes from this note tree counts as one. So this bottom number is a four. So if you think about it like a fraction, one fourth, that's a quarter. So that's telling you, this time signature is telling you that there are three quarter notes per measure. Okay, so then now we can say, okay, based on that information, if we wanted to know, well, how many beats is a half note worth in this time signature? Well, you consult this thing. If the quarter note is one beat and the half note's kind of the next layer up, then that is worth two beats here. Okay, maybe this is review for some of you, but I think uh, just stick with me here. All right, so let's do this example here and it, clap it or count it with me, okay? Here we go. One, two, three. One, two, and three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right? So pretty straightforward little rhythm. Okay, hang on to that. Let's go to this time signature. We have three, two. So this is similar, but different, right? So we have three beats per bar. That's what the top number is telling us. The bottom number is telling us that now the half note equals the beat. Remember, think about it as a fraction, one half. So half note equals one. So we have three half notes per bar. All right, let's look at another musical example. Okay, here we go. Do it with me at home. One, two, Go. One, two, and three. One, three. One, and two, and three. Huh. That sounds uh, familiar, doesn't it? It's the exact same thing as the one we did before, right? So this three, four, and three, two, if, if I clapped one and didn't tell you what time signature is, you wouldn't know the difference, right? They sound exactly the same. Time signatures very rarely have much to do with tempo. Sometimes they might imply a tempo, but really they, they're they just how, it's just defining what counts as one. So these two patterns, three, four, and three, two, or yeah, three, four, or three, two, actually sound the same here. They're just written differently, right? In the first example, the quarter note is getting the beat, and those eighth notes are getting half of a beat. And then in the second example, uh, the half note is getting the beat and quarter notes are equal to half of a beat. So it's, a, it's just good to understand it kind of theoretically before we get into too much more of a difficult example. Okay, let's look at a more difficult one. I think 6-8 is, is where a lot of people start to have a little rhythmic stumbling. Okay, so let's look at it. Here's uh, six eight, right? So there's six beats per bar. The eighth note, one eighth, equals the beat. So you could count this in what we call a slow six, where you're counting each of these. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, six. One, two, three, four, right? Very slow, but sometimes six eight doesn't feel like that. Often what we have is kind of, we call 6-8 a compound meter. And that's because there are two layers of rhythm happening simultaneously. At one level, at the lower level, we have um, the eighth note going. And then above that, we have these kind of macro beats. And you'll notice that it's really, 6-8 is really the same as a feeling of two. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. 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 
right? So there's kind of these two layers of rhythm going on simultaneously, the subdivisional pulse of eighth notes, and then kind of the macro beat of the dotted quarter. And so what you really have to do when you're reading a rhythm like this is train your eye to see the dotted quarter note as the beat. And that gets maybe a little trickier in uh, the second bar where you see that quarter note and you think, oh, well, that's just a beat. But it's you got to count that, that eighth note as part of that first bigger beat. So it's this compound layering that can trick people up a little bit. All right, let's look at another example here. This is nine eight. Okay, so nine beats per bar, and the eighth note is getting the beat. Okay, so if we look at this example here, um, you'll see that, it, again, you could count it as, as a slow nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But more often than not, this is a compound triple meter. So that it's really three macro beats of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ta 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 ta. So again, it's this kind of these levels of rhythm, and the best metaphor for this, I think, is the duck swimming. Right on top, it's just gliding along, nice and smooth, and underneath. It's paddling like mad. And that's how these compound meters feel, right? So we have this kind of larger beat, and then underneath it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's a, just a very brief overview of how time signatures work, and in particular, how compound meters work. And we're going to come back to that at the end. I should just note. Um, I'm going to look at the chat here in a minute, but I should just note that um, the opposite of a compound meter, so something like 4-4, is called a simple meter. Those are meters that the beat divides into two even beats, so one and two and three and four and. That's a simple meter. Compound meters have these two layers of rhythm, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the beat divides into three groups. And so that's why we have like 6, 8, 9, 8, 12, 8. Those would be compound meters. All right, let's take a minute here before we get into the next topic here. And I saw a couple questions here. Here's one from Dale Russell. Um, why would a composer choose 3-2 uh, time over 3-4 time in a given case? That's a good question, Dale. I think some of it um, is just history. I think it, the older the music, they tended to use white note values as the beat, so like a half note. Uh, I once did a piece by William Byrd, the great English Renaissance composer, that the whole note was the beat, right? So I think they were that was more of what they're accustomed to. I think over time, we've gotten used to viewing the quarter note as the beat. So more of a modern piece might use three, four as a time. I don't know why that convention switched, but that's kind of my best guess. Let's see, I saw one here from, let's see, here's one from Deb. She says, interesting, uh, biggest adjustment, I'm sorry, I gotta get rid of this window here. All right, coming from being a percussionist is really realizing a sung note has three events, the start, duration, and finish. That's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, we really have to think as singers, in particular, I would maybe use the terms onset, right? We, I talked about that a little bit in some of the videos I've made for CMS about the difference between an aspirate, ha, ha, where the air starts early, uh, coordinate, uh, I'll do glottal, where your voice starts early, ah, uh, you get kind of that edge on the sound, or a coordinated onset where the voice and the uh, air start at the same time, ah, uh, right? So we, we talk a lot about onset, then we hopefully are doing something on the note, and then we have to release the note, right? I don't like the term cutoff, but you're right. There really are three events. I like that. Um, I think that's it for the chat. So we'll come back to that in a little bit, but let's go on to this concept. We've already started to touch on it of seeing the beat groupings. This is where if you can learn to, to see the beat groupings, your rhythmic life will change. 
okay? So let's look at the scary example I made. Here's a passage actually from the Mozart Requiem. And um, I took out all the, the beaming. And so it's all at individual flags of 16th notes and 8th notes. And if you ask me to sing or play this, it, it, I wouldn't know where to begin, right? I would have to sit down and circle where the beats are, right? It, it's very, there's just what we'd say, there's a lot of ink on the page, right? Okay, now let me show you it all beamed correctly. Way better, right? You can kind of see just intrinsically where the beat falls, right? It, it gets a lot simpler here. Um, and now I'm going to make it even easier by putting these red lines, right? So you'll notice that the way that composers and, and musicians beam the groups, and uh, by beam I mean connect groups of the eighth notes and sixteenth notes, makes it way easier to actually see where the beat begins. And I put a vertical line where each of the beat begins. And the reason that this is so helpful is that if you can see where the beat falls, you know, okay, I've got these four notes. Let me get my hand there. I got these four notes, and I've got to fit them equally within this beat. Da 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 da, da 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 da. Right? You can. It it, may, it gets a lot easier. It's when we lose track of the beats that we don't know where things fall. So by keeping a very solid sense of inner pulse, and then by by knowing where the beats fall, we are able to have kind of mile markers of, of places to kind of hang our hat in another way, in other words. So let's look at this example here. We're in 4-4, four, four, so this is the most common time signature, right? We're in a common time, literally. So we have four beats per measure. The quarter note equals the beat. And I picked this passage for a couple reasons. The first is just, it, it, I'll go back to this without my markings on it. It doesn't look that hard, but it's more than just, you know, 16 16th notes per bar, right? We have these ties going on. Sometimes we have 16 16th eighth, like the the first beat of the second measure. Um, we have that pattern a couple times, right? So it's not just super clear where this is, and especially the ties to me are where we might fall into uh, like some rhythmic trouble. All right, so let's look at this here, and I'll just play it for you. It goes three, four, and one. Good, let's do that again, and I want you to count it out loud, okay? So I'll get, let's count a whole bar before. One, two, three, four, one. Right? If you're keeping that, all of a sudden you can feel those ties. You have something to bounce off of it, right? The famous conductor Robert Shaw described these as springboard moments. You can feel that like a diving board, and you have energy for the rest of the phrase. Right? So we, it can energize a phrase and make you much more accurate. It's not just kind of like, I'm guessing where this is, right? You, you're actually hanging your hat on something very tangible, which is the beat. So seeing these beat groupings, I think, is the biggest game changer. And uh, we're going to talk about how to see that more and more as we go on. All right, <clears throat> so some tips for practicing. How do we practice music in a way that we improve and don't get frustrated? I think it took me a long time to practice. I think a lot of people who go on in music, maybe go to college or graduate school for music, it's only then that they really learn how to practice. Because I, in my experience, people don't always aren't always taught how to practice. So these are kind of my tips for learning how to practice. And we're going to use this Mozart example here um, just because we're already in it. All right. So the first tip here is to remove one element. So let's say um, that you are, I'm going to share my screen, that 
that you are um, working on this passage. Here it is in the base part, right? And this passage isn't all that hard, um, but you know, in in the case of a long fugue, you know, there are a lot of moments like this. So it's not that this is that hard, but you know, there's you've you've already been singing for a couple pages here, so you've had you've seen a lot of notes already. So the first thing is to remove one element. The f so for me, it might be hard to say the words, especially because you have like do. Oh, I'm sorry. Do na do na You have these little extra notes that's on this syllable, and so for me, like getting all the words and the notes at the same time is often a struggle. So I would remove an element. Maybe I would sing it on pa. Pa 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 until I can do it correctly. And what do I mean by correctly? I don't mean that I can do it when I'm playing the piano. You'll notice that I'm not playing the piano when I'm practicing. Um, and you'll notice that I'm observing the markings in the score, doing the, the crescendo and the leggero marking. Um, so I'm practicing it really accurately to do it. So I'll do that until I'm able to do it correctly. Then I would remove another element. So now I'm going to remove the, um, the music or the notes and just say the words. Do ho na ha, do ho ho na ha ha ha, eh ha 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 he he stole. Right? And get it until I can do that in time. Maybe I'd even set a metronome and practice it so I'm really keeping honest that I'm, I'm not rushing or dragging the tempo in this. And then finally, I'd put it all together. I'd sing it and um, on, the, on the text in rhythm. I think removing an element is, is key here to progressing. Um, so remove it until you can do it well and then add in, uh, add things back in. The next tip here is to practice slowly, right? Um, so looking back at the score, one of the big trouble spots in my mind is right here. So we have, um, we're in F major, there's one flat, B flat, but all of a sudden this E flat starts to creep in. And what's tricky is right before it, there's an E natural. So we have, starting here on this F, right? Now, what ends up happening in my experience, and I'm not, don't take this personally if, if this is you, but in my experience, people sing by playing the piano with themselves, which again, I think just you're practicing piano then instead of practicing singing. So be careful about that. But what they do is they say, oh, I kind of got that, yeah? Um, you don't really know if you got that E flat or not. Right, it's kind of approximate, and you're playing the piano at the same time. So I'd sing do na and double check it. And by going slowly, you're gonna get a real sense of if you're singing E natural, D, E flat. Right, that's a tricky little thing. You can only really check yourself though if you're going slowly. So that's the real thing. Practice it slowly, make sure you're practicing it accurately, and then speed it back up until it's correct. Finally, I'd mark your score, right? <laughs> no surprise, you've seen my scores here a couple times. You know that I mark my scores pretty heavily and spend a lot of time thinking about it. And um, my scores are marked differently because I'm conducting instead of singing. But I think it's really important to add that physical layer, right? Um, I think sometimes we think of scores as being kind of these sacred objects uh, that we shouldn't touch, right? Um, you never write in pen in your music or whatever. Some of that's good, you know, especially if you're borrowing the music. But if you bought your own copy like we do in CMS, that's your copy, right? And I think the more you spend time with it, the more ingrained you will have it. You will know that piece kind of on a cellular level. And so in my music, I mark a ton, but you know, you could add little things that we talk about in rehearsal. You'll notice even here, I have the beat lines kind of faintly drawn in. I have these little, they look like kind of end parentheses. That's how I mark Legero. Um, you see a little accent, little swell on the ties, right? This is all stuff that 
I don't need to do every time we um, in every thing. It's like it's not that I don't remember it, but for me, there's something really physical about marking your music. And science tells us that when we write things down, we remember them better. And so it doesn't matter whether you um, whether you your markings mean something to someone else. It doesn't matter at all. I think that it's really just the act of writing that will uh, improve your your learning and and the more you get out of it. One of the other things that I really love, one of the greatest joys, is actually coming back to a piece that you've marked like this. And even if you don't remember it all, you know, and you're like, oh, I can't find that E flat, you'll it'll come back to you faster because you at one time learned it so deeply. And um, for me, it's like when I pick up a score that I've conducted before, I kind of pick it up and it's like it's like seeing an old friend. And I kind of remember, oh yeah, we really I had to do it this way, or I remember the look on the soprano's face when they have this great line or whatever. It's it's kind of like a time capsule. And so I really encourage you to, to put that extra effort into your, into your physical music. And I think you'll get so much more emotionally out of it. I think that, that effort is well worth it. So those are my tips. Um, don't be afraid to mark your music, really. I mean, I think the only, it's, there's no shame. You know, I have, um, I'm the music director of CMS and I have a doctorate in music. I mark my music all the time. There's no shame in it. The only shame, and I use that with air quotes, is making the same mistake repeatedly. So fix your mistakes, mark it down so that you can do it better the next time. All right, let's look, uh, oh, I do wanna just end with this little statement about um, practicing, and, and then we're gonna look at some more musical examples. Um, this is uh, practice makes permanent. Practice doesn't make per, uh, perfect because you could practice poorly, right? You could learn something wrong. I have learned things wrong and it's a horrible feeling because it takes like seven times longer, seven times 70 times longer to relearn something correctly. So really be careful about how you're learning. Practice makes permanent. And I think the best um, choirs in the world, what separates them from really good choirs, the very best choirs, everybody does the same thing every time. It's consistency. And a lot of that is mental. A lot of that is mental, that they are mentally consistent every time everybody does the same thing. And that, that's because they practice slowly, they're good listeners, and they mark their music. So that's my tips for practicing. All right, before we get into some advanced examples, let's look at um, the chat here. Hmm, I think... I think we're doing pretty well on the chat. I'll come back and check later. All right, some advanced examples, right? Uh, let's look at these compound meters again. So we're gonna nine, eight, remember this is what we call a compound triple, right? So there's three big beats and they're each subdivided into three. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Compound quadruple then is four macro beats and each is subdivided into three. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. One, two, three, four, right? And we see this, this kind of time signature frequently. Bach 12, eight, like Schlumertein, the great bass solo, these beautiful, lots of, of great Bach in nine, eight or 12, eight. Okay, but let's look at um, an example by the great American composer, Samuel Barber. Let me switch my scores here. Um, so the, the, the example that we're gonna look at is the Kulin. This is by, um, like I mentioned, Samuel Barber um, from a set of pieces called The Reincarnations. This is the, the last one. This is my, one of my all time favorite choral pieces. And it's, oh, it's so hard. <laughs> and it, the, I did this a couple of years ago and um, it's tricky for a number of reasons. First of all, it's really slow. So quarter, dotted quarter note at 50, and it, um, or 50 to 54. And it's, it alternates here between 12-8, 9-8. It goes back on the page turn to 12-8. Uh, 
and it's very um very romantic right it's it wants to be rubato but then it's tricky to kind of keep all the the subdivisional pulse constant here so this text um i'll just say it for you it goes like three and come with me under my coat and we will drink our fill of the milk of the white goat or wine if it be thy will right so i'm thinking that that whole time even though i'm snapping the dotted quarter in my head i'm thinking yep ba, ba, yep ba, ba. come with me under my coat and we will drink right it's it's this again that duck metaphor of the paddling under the water and very smooth on top one of the other trickier things to me is um that the the page this particular pagination doesn't kind of graphically represent the beat so if you think about the beat the dotted quarter note here under my these three notes equal one beat right they take up a lot of space on the page especially compared to the word me this dotted half which equals two beats right so you can't even kind of graphically oh well this note you know this takes up so much space it must be longer no actually this is longer and this is even longer right that's three beats right so it, it this one you really have to use your brain um, and count the whole time and subdivide to make sure that we're really constantly the only hope of keeping this piece together is everyone in the room using that subdivisional pulse and um it gets even trickier you know this part's not too bad because it's all homophonic everyone's moving at the same time but when we get later on we get these kind of um, imitative sections and that gets really tricky so it's um it's a very beautiful piece but that was one where kind of that compound meter was especially difficult and we we really when i was doing this with my college choir we really had to keep that subdivisional pulse going the whole time. All right, let's look at another example here, which is seven, eight. This is what we call an asymmetrical meter. Maybe you know the famous uh, Dave Brubeck take five, right? That's an asymmetrical meter. Basically, that means that the, the beat groups are unevenly sized. So uh, we have in this example in seven, eight, it feels like three, one, two, three but one of those beats is longer than the others and that's because seven doesn't add up to an even number right so you can um you can have a group of, uh, of two one two or a group of three one two three and it's different than a triplet it's an extra eighth note right so the groups of two are groups of two eighth notes the groups of three would be a group of three eighth notes so that beat is an eighth note or half a beat half of a quarter note longer than the other ones. So then you have these combinations you could do. I mean, these are the way that you can add up to seven, right? You can do two plus two plus three, which would be one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. You could do two, three, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. Or you could do three, two, two. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Okay, so that's asymmetrical meter where it feels like you're in three. One, two, three, one, two, three. But one of those beats is going to be an eighth note longer. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. Okay, so let's look at an example. This is one of my uh, very favorite um, pieces to do that it's just kind of fun at the holidays this is called deck the halls in seven eight it's an old chestnut um it's been around for a long time and um th this is a, lo a lot of fun just because it really kind of has like the joy of the holidays so it'd be deck the halls with boughs of holly la 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 
is a season to be jolly. La 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 la. Okay, so how did I get there? Let me show you. Um, you'll notice at the top here that I have all these angles and triangles. That's my kind of shorthand for um, seeing the beat groupings. If it's a two plus two plus three bar or three plus two plus two bar. So if it's a three grouping, I put a triangle because triangles have three sides. Look at that, I passed sophomore geometry. All right, and then I, these angles are two groupings because they only have two sides. So this bar would be one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Same with the next bar, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Now look at the third bar, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, right? So this piece is kind of tricky because it's constantly switching how the seven is grouped, okay? How did I figure out how those were grouped? Well, um, I'm looking at the bass part, okay? And again, this goes to seeing the beat groupings, right? And you can rely on the stems to show you that. So I see three, three notes connected. That's telling me that that's a three grouping. Fa la la, right? Then here we have three, and then these are two connected, and these are two connected. La 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 Right? So these are, this, the beaming of this, the tenor and bass part are informing how I'm grouping it. And that's just because for me, it's a little easier to see than here, right up here. So then, you know, you mark it all in, you go through the whole piece, you figure out how it's beamed and how it's grouped. And then it goes back to those points that we talked about. Remove an element, right? Maybe the notes are, in the, are tricky. So can you speak it? Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Fa la 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 la. Tis the sea. And then add in the singing. And once we do that, and maybe we're doing something physical to keep the beat, this piece isn't as frustrating as it might seem, but is actually kind of fun and an infectious melody. Believe me, if you ever hear or have sung this piece before, uh, you'll know it never really gets out of your head. It's a complete earworm. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about 7-8. And you know, this music is not scary. I think people are often intimidated by a meter that they're, they've never seen before. Um, but I think if, if I taught this to you by rote, you'd have no problem, right? I think it's kind of like we get shocked by seeing something we're not used to. But I guess my point tonight is if you take a moment and you kind of carefully think about it and really just kind of try and reason your way there, it, it isn't that scary and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's because music really is a lot, very much like math right? And that also can be very intimidating for people. But if we slow down and kind of think through it rationally, we can often f get used to it over time. And, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but I hope maybe to have shared tonight with you some tricks for understanding where the rhythm is coming from and so that you can apply it to your own music making. I'm going to take just a minute here and look at and see if there are any other questions in the chat. I think it. I think we're doing well. Oh, I just want to throw this one up. Uh, let's see. Yellow's Dark Knight of the Soul has eight time signatures that you switch among that switch among twenty one times, including seven eight and seven four. That's right. And um, I love that piece. And I, I know I've, I've I conducted that uh, with some of the CMS people in the group. And um, I think that that's just that exuberance he's trying to capture this kind of uh, revelation. Evan Craig says here, modern composers seem to use time signatures just to show off and confuse sing singers. <laughs> what are they trying to accomplish by changing time signatures? That's a really good question. Um, I don't think that, that um, composers are trying to show off or be difficult. The big thing that modern composers are trying to do is serve the text, 
right? And then I'm gonna do a whole session on text setting and poetry later on in CMS University. So I, I hope you'll tune in for that, Evan. But um, basically what they're trying to do is align the strong beats of the poetry with the strong beats of the music. Um, and that their job, they I think a lot of modern composers view their job is to um, musically illuminate the text, to heighten the text through their, their, their music. And so they really wanna serve the text and make it feel as speech-like as possible. That's not always easy to do um, if, if you're in 4-4, because if you think, just listening to myself talk here, it's not metered. It's not kind of in the same thing. If it was, it would start to sound, if I started to talk in a very metered way, I'd start to sound like Dr. Seuss or something. So I think a lot of composers are, are trying really to kind of capture a natural prosody versus um, just staying in the same thing. And um, that, that doesn't maybe convey the emotion that the text is calling for. That's my best guess, but I, I don't think uh, that they're trying to confuse you at all. And if they are, that's why I'm here. All right, Rick, let's see. Uh, ragtime music is almost always in 4-8, but written in 2-4, except for one rag by Max Marath called uh, Polyragmith. Uh, Ragmit, uh, sorry. That is all over the map. Your hands are in completely different times in the same bar. I don't know. Ragtime music is so hard, and it's so fun to listen to, but I know it's it's very difficult with the stride. Um, but, you know, there, there's just kind of... A, certain musics do have certain conventions, right? Um, so, for example, I talked a lot about um, earlier music, you know, Renaissance music. Often, the, the beat is at a white note value, so like a half note. So, um, like any motet by Talis or Palestrina, that's going to be usually at the half note or even whole note level. And I wonder if Rag kind of developed a similar thing that that's just kind of how they wrote it at the time. Um, but I, yeah, I wish I could say more about that. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's um, before you go, I, I don't want you to cancel out yet, um, but I do have a few housekeeping things before our um, moment of Zen. Okay. So Next week, we finish our musicianship series all about harmony. I'm really excited to show you just a little bit about harmony works, how it works, and then um, we're going to use some real world examples as well to help you learn to sing and see how your part fits into others, which is really what makes us, that's the difference between a choral singer and a solo singer, right? If you're singing a solo, you worry about fitting in with the piano, but it's really about you. When we're in choir, we have to work together, right? So that's going to be the main focus of that. You can register for that session and any others by clicking the Eventbrite link in the description below. I hope you will like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're watching the recording, comment on it, or even if you have a question after this is over, you can leave a comment and I'll try and get back to you as quickly as I'm able to. Let's see. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, there's no um, limit on CMSU. Uh, it's completely free. So please um, invite a friend, invite your choir director, maybe share it with your church group or your kid's high school choir director. Maybe they could use it in this era of virtual instruction, but please help us get out the word. I did want to let you know that we are accepting donations for CMS University. So um, you can click on the links in the video description below to Patreon or Buy Me a Coffee where we, you can kind of subscribe on your, on your um, credit card. Or you could go to our website, chicagomastersingers.org and make a one-time donation. Thank you in advance for your generosity. All right, the moment you've been waiting for, your moment of Zen tonight. Tonight, we're going to listen to a piece called Indodana, which is from uh, South, Amer uh, South Africa. And it's a really beautiful, soulful piece. And this is arranged by uh, the conductor of the University of Pretoria Choir. And he's, he's the one conducting this. And they're the ones performing this recording tonight. This is in the 
Osa language, and it has a fun tongue click to do. And it's a hopeful text. Um, the translation's on the screen in the video, but I'll just share it with you. The Lord has taken his son who lived among us. The son of the Lord God was crucified. I hope you enjoy Indodana.
Thank you, everybody. I hope you're doing well and staying healthy, and I'll see you next week.